1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland. World War II has begun. There was seen to be no disturbance of the atmosphere in the studio. Uh, I think we knew what Hitler was, and I think we knew what some of the consequences could be. But it, this was a world apart from the whole universe. The exhausted company was still recovering from the tragic news of the death of Sidney Howard in a tractor accident on his farm. But there was barely time to grieve. The pressure was on to get the next cut ready for preview. Mr. Selden wanted to have a preview without the press knowing about it. He wanted to get an actual audience reaction with no press aware. So Mr. Kern told him, the only way to do that is let me make all the arrangements, because if you know about it, you'll tell everybody. On September the 9th, Hal Kern told Selznick the time had come, and they left the studio with 54 cans of film and soundtrack. It was a seemingly hot afternoon, and they drove for over two hours out of Los Angeles. With them were Jim Newcomb, Jock Whitney, and Irene Selznick. Eventually, the car pulled up at the Fox Theatre in Riverside. They were showing Beau Geste with Gary Cooper, so there was sure to be a good crowd inside. Mr. Selznick waited outside on the pavement and sent for the manager, who obviously jumped to the right conclusion, very clearly promising anything, anything. You know, there's something in the air here that makes me... You too? Oh, that's just how it affects me. And sometimes I wish some big, strong man would just grab me and run off with me. The minute I came to the theater that night, because it was so very hot outside, the theater was very cool. I came mainly because I wanted to see Beau Jest. We're watching Hawaiian Nights. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, May I have your attention, please? Instead the house of a lights came in, and then went on the stage and announced that we were now going to see a major studio, uh, studio preview, preview of an important new film. What? What's the picture? What? Who's in it? I'm sorry, I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell you it's a little long, folks. So if any of you want to call home, please do, because from this moment on, the doors will be locked. And nobody knew will be allowed into the theater. We were anxious to see how it was going to go. Was it really as great as we thought it was? To be the judge, not the critics, and not the reporters. Thank you. How long is it? The final titles were not yet made, and the music wasn't written. So Hal Kern had laid in music tracks from The Prisoner of Zenda. Margaret Mitchell's name came on the screen. You never heard such a song in your life. And when Dawn with the Wind came on, it was just thunderous. They just yelled and they stood up on the seats. I had that music wide open and you couldn't hear a thing. Mrs. Selznick was crying like a baby and so was David. And so was I. Oh, what a trip. When the wind finished playing, you could hear a pin drop. The audience was just stunned. That's when I turned to my mother and said, now can we see Beaujest? I don't seem to be able to find any fault with the picture. 
I believe that it is the best picture that ever was or will be produced. A long picture, if good, is well worth seeing. Leave it long, but cut everything else. News, shorts, everything. Gone with the Wind is happily stuck to the book. It's fine. I'd like to say that I think Vivian Lee is one of the most super colossally great actresses I've ever seen. Don't cut the picture, cut everything else off the program. I want to thank you for allowing me folk in Riverside the privilege of seeing it first. Every mm -hmm. adult man and woman should be required to see it. And they <laughs> Three years ago, when David O. Selznick prepared to make Gone with the Wind, he promised it would be the finest movie ever produced. After three years, Selznick's job is done. Those who've seen Gone with the Wind agree it's one of the greatest motion pictures ever produced. Now, the reason I'm citing the greatness of this movie is to prove in the next breath that it's cost three million dollars is far too much to spend on one motion picture. In order to get back its prohibitive cost, Gone with the Wind would have to show in every city and town in the world. It's a sense to show a huge financial loss and should be conclusive evidence that it's folly to gamble two and three million dollars on single pictures. Despite the success of the preview, Selznick was still improving the film and even adding to it. Vivian Lee was called back to America for retakes. Her mother shot this fragment of her working on the fifth and final version of the opening scene. It was only a month away from the preview date, and now there was a new panic. The music was, in Mr. Selznick's opinion, one of the principal stars of the picture. But he made a mistake in not preparing it sooner. He wanted Max Steiner, and I think we had to wait for him. It was a frenzied, last-minute attempt to get the pictures what is it, three hours of, th of music? Steiner has again told us he cannot meet the date. The reason we're continuing with him is because of my belief that his work will be a great deal better than it sounded on a few pieces. Fearful that Steiner might not make it, Selznick engaged two other composers to back him up, Franz Waxman and Herbert Stothert. Stothert had a few drinks on Saturday night, apparently, and did a lot of loose talking about how he was going to have to fix up Max's work. Within 10 minutes, it was back to Max, and he was in a rage. Max really went to town, and the result is that by tomorrow, we will have considerably more than half the picture scored. Real 48 coming in. Here we go. 108 Max Steiner was a Selznick veteran. He'd done Bird of Paradise, King Kong, and the Garden of Allah for him. He had also scored Jezebel for Warners, so he came to the task well-versed in Southern folk music. He blended a lot of it into the wind. The Atlanta Prem